Welcome to the Washington Heights Church Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Each week, we bring you the latest Sunday message filled with God's Word to help strengthen your faith and deepen your walk with Christ. Whether you're tuning in from home, your commute, or anywhere in between, we're thrilled to have you join our community. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's get started. Well, last week, Pastor Roy kicked us off on a brand new series called The Shadow King, looking at the life of David. He's one of my favorites in the Bible. I'm so excited about this series. Pastor Roy is actually right now in Poland with on their second trip, taking some much needed medical supplies that will be taken across the border into Ukraine with a small team there. And so uh, I'm sure he would uh, appreciate your prayers for safety and travel. Before we jump into our message, one of the things we love to do here is baby dedications. Manny, this is Pastor Manny, our children's pastor. Would you invite our family up? Yes, we have the Ordonez family, and it's Eric, Kimberly, and their daughter, Amelia. So if you guys want to come on up. Awesome. And we want to um, let you guys know that we appreciate you guys wanting to dedicate Amelia and recognize the importance of her life and following Jesus and all the things. So I'm going to um, read a verse that you guys chose. They chose Joshua 1, nine, and it's, uh, <laughs> it says, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go, Joshua 1.9. So I'll hand that off to you. And if you all want to stand with us, we're going to pray. God, we thank you so much for the gift of life. And we thank you especially today for the gift that you've given this family of Amelia. God, we ask that you be with her as she goes through her journey of life. God, we're all on a journey, and she will be too, and we just ask that you guide her, that you help her to know that you're there, just as that verse says, and that she can go to you when she's frightened, and that she can come to you for whatever she needs, God. We ask that you be with her family, God, with her parents, that you unite them as they um, journey together, raising her, God, and we just present her before you today, and we thank you for the gift of life and for her and for this family, Jesus. And in your name we pray, amen. Amen. She is adorable. (laughs) Well, we are jumping in again to this brand new series, The Shadow King, looking at the life of David. And before we do that, I want to I want to start off with a passage that uh, Paul shared in in the New Testament, which kind of presents this snapshot of of how God views each one of us. Um, and and it applies to the life of David because David is like the least likely candidate to be chosen to be the king of all the Israelites. And something that Paul writes in in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says this, and this gives us this this idea of God's heart and how he looks at each one of us. He said this, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Now, if you've ever done anything successful in your life, you might want to say amen, because that is God working in your life, because we sometimes are a hot mess. Am I right? Yes, we are. And God loves to take those things that are the hot messes in our life to do incredible things, things that we could never begin to imagine. And that is certainly what happens in the life of David. So just to give a little bit of context, uh, the Israelites, back, you know, several hundred years before this was written, the Israelites have now become, they've they've settled into their promised land, this land that God was giving to them, that Moses led them from Egypt into this place. They've now been there for a few years. They've kind of had their ups and their downs. They've had some really great seasons of being, you know, really connected with God and, and seasons where they've really fallen away. And through all of that, God has sent these people called the prophets. And these prophets, were essentially God's mouthpiece. They were spokespersons on on God's behalf. And he would come in and say, hey, look, you guys, you got to get your act together because you're not 
living according to what God would have you do. Or he will come in and say, hey, this is what I need from you. He would be counselor to the king and he'd help all kinds of people guide and journey. He was the mouthpiece for God. Well, the people decided um, they wanted to be like every other nation. They wanted a king. And and Samuel, who was the prophet at the time, uh, he kind of pushes back. He's like, guys, you you don't want to be like the rest of the world. Allow God to be your king. Allow God to lead you. Allow God to be that person that you look to for your leadership. But they fought back. They said, no, we want to be like everybody else. We want a king. And so uh, Samuel chose a man by the name of Saul. And the Bible says that Saul stood a a good head and shoulders above everybody else. He was this tall, warrior, strong guy. Samuel took one look and said, "That's, that's the one. That's the guy. And he anointed him. He became king. And shortly after he fell away, he started to do things on his own, disobeying God's command disobeying the way that God would have him live. And so God told Samuel, I have rejected Saul as the king of Israel. This broke Samuel's heart. He spent many, many days mourning because he was uh, Saul's mentor, his guide. He kind of like brought him up, journeyed, you know, counseled and coached him on how to be a good king. And when God rejected him, this broke Samuel. And that's where we're going to pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 16. It says, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I've rejected him from being the king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. God has chosen somebody else. God has chosen a, a candidate that nobody else would have chosen. In fact, the verses go on and it says that uh, Samuel's kind of like, okay, if, if I go and... and Word gets to Saul that I'm anointing somebody else to become king. He's going to kill me. So God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a young cow. You're going to offer a sacrifice to God, to me, and bring the town in, kind of make it a, make it a thing, make it a, a celebration. Invite Jesse and his sons to be a part of it. And while you're doing this sacrifice, you can then anoint the son that I will show you. So he's like, okay. And it's funny because the verses go on and you can tell that back then the prophets were uh, a big deal as the mouthpiece, the spokesperson for God, because it says that Jesse stroll, or not Jesse, uh, Samuel strolls into Bethlehem and all the local elders, they come around and they're like, "Um, did we do something wrong? Why are you here? Are we in trouble? Have we done anything bad? And he's like, no, 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 no. We're going to, we're going to offer up a, a, a sacrifice to God. So at this sacrifice... Samuel asked Jesse to present his sons, and naturally, he presents the oldest. That was the way things would have gone. And typically, in that culture, the expectation would have been that this this rite of passage, this kinghood that would be passed down, would have gone to the oldest. In fact, it says uh, Jesse presented his oldest son, Eliab, and and it says this, "When when they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely, this is the guy. He's gorgeous. He's a handsome man. He's tall. He's got good posture. Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. And and I got to wonder in that moment, because I wonder, you know, for Samuel, he's like, okay, this is is the guy. And, And God says, nope. Okay, okay, but that's kind of what I would have thought. That's kind of, I think, what everyone here is thinking. And God's like, nope, next. It says the next one went before him. God says, nope. Then the next son, nope. Then the next son, nope. In fact, it says this. Oh, he goes on to say, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And that's primarily what we're going to be talking about today. So it goes on, it says, and Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And you got to imagine Samuel going, okay, God sent me here. He told me to come to Jesse. He told me to come to Bethlehem. Uh, Dude, are all your kids here? Like what? I don't know what's going on. And, and Samuel, Jesse says, there, there remains yet the youngest, but he's, he's out 
in the field. He's, he's the pipsqueak. He's the little guy. He's the bottom of the totem pole, the nobody. I wouldn't even think to bring him here. He's out being a shepherd. Like he's watching the sheep. And it's interesting that he wasn't even invited. He wasn't even considered in a high enough position to be included in this ritual, this ceremony, this anointing. And I love what Samuel says. He says, send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. Now, for everybody else, the older brothers, the father, even the prophet himself, the people of the town, to wait on the youngest of this family, to stand and wait, was unheard of. But it just proves this point of God using the weak things, God using the shameful things, God using the things that we would not consider or even give any significance to, God says, that's what I want to use. So as I read through this, I started thinking, well, it goes on to say, and he said and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. And I can imagine the confusion, the emotions that are happening in the room, like, or in this area that they're in, because here's, here's the youngest, the, the guy that's really not the guy, being anointed. I could imagine for Samuel, there was this cultural expectation that he had on who he thought should be king. And as I was was studying through this passage and reading this, it made me think about what kind of cultural expectations or presumptions we place on ourselves about church, about God. I asked this question. I said, what, what presumptions or expectations do you carry, about, carry around about God or the church? Right? There's this expectation that we have to, to look, talk, act, and, and, and be a certain way. And that if we don't, if we don't meet those expectations, then we are less than, we are considered kind of the outcast, or maybe that we need to perform a little bit more for God. There's a common Christian expectation, and maybe not for every single one of us, but if we were to take maybe just the United States, this culture of Christianity, the the common Christian expectation that on a broad scope says this, perform for God and he will approve of you. Right, and that includes our our behavior, our lifestyle, how we speak, church involvement, all the things, right? We try to earn this, fill this this tank of of credit for God that if, you know, we get enough credit, then God's going to look at at, at, an approval at us. But if we mess up, if we make a mistake, then our credit goes down and God's a little disappointed. But if we work a little bit harder, then our credit goes up and he's like, okay, now you're doing good. And we kind of play this game of performing for God. My, uh, every, time, every time I mow my yard, there's a strip of grass that runs between the sidewalk and the street, and there's about a, uh, I don't know, say seven or eight foot strip that goes beyond my yard, and it's my, my neighbor's property. But I, I'm, I'm always like, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to mow that because I don't want there to be a weird line. You know, it'll just be nice and clean. Even so I mow it and I trim it. And without fail, I kid you not, without fail, every single time I have the thought, you know, I'm a really good guy. <laughs> Man, that was a, I'm a good neighbor. Like, I mowed this guy's yard. He didn't even have to ask me. It wasn't, it wasn't a favor. I just did it out of my own goodwill. You know, I bet God's looking down. And he's like, that a boy? I wonder if my neighbor's like peeking through the blinds going, oh man, what a good guy. But that's the game we play with God, right? Where we do, we do some nice things. We do some good things. We attend church. We give. We volunteer. We do the things. We kind of fill this, this credit with God. And we feel like God's looking down and, and going, all right, good job. But if we mess up, if we screw something up, if we do something wrong, then we've lost a little bit of credit with God. And then we get that nagging voice. You guys know that nagging voice, Right? those thoughts that creep in, the whisper that we hear. 
No, he didn't do it right this time. Mm, it wasn't that good. You could have done better. I was thinking about this voice, this nagging voice that we hear. And I was thinking about this situation that happens with Jesse and with David, with Eliab and Samuel. You know, I wonder for Eliab, the oldest brother, to not have been picked. What was running through his mind? What kind of nagging voice was whispering in his ear? Or even for Samuel, God's mouthpiece, the guy he thought he was going to anoint, God said no. And, and what, kind of, what kind of doubt and, and negative self-talk was he feeling? Oh, maybe I'm not supposed to be the guy that I'm, I'm maybe I'm not. The... You're, not a, you're not really a good dad or a good mom. Don't fool yourself. Loser. You can act like you are. You can make all kinds of great posts with your kids, but I, God, I know what happens in your home. Well, you lost your temper again. You failed. You got out of control. I lusted after her again. I lusted after him again. She's a married woman. He's a married man. They have a relationship. I'm not in a relationship. God, what a... Worthless. You're just fooling yourself. It's hopeless. Like, just... You're not, you're not fooling anybody. You're not kidding everybody. Right? No one is buying the, the facade, right? We put on the facade to show that we are something that inside... We know that we're not. Maybe not all the time, but there's certainly moments where we know that our thoughts and what's going on in our heart is not what we are presenting on the outside. And that voice starts to dig in. You're not meeting the expectation. You're not performing good enough. You're worthless. You're hopeless. You're not that good of a Christian. Who are you kidding? Right? We've got that that self-talk, that voice that runs rampant in our lives. And when it happens, when it happens, what what do we do? What's typically the first response that we think of, well, if, 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 if all these negative things are happening, if I'm not really that good of a person, da, 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 well, I got to perform harder. I just got to do a little bit more. I got to build that credit tank up a little bit higher, and then God's going to say, yeah, good job. Have you guys watched the show, The Voice, singing competition? I... I pretty much watched just the beginning part of it. I love the audition process. Um, if, if you're unfamiliar with it, you know, these contestants who, who think they can sing, some of them really can sing and they're amazing. These contestants come and they do a, a blind audition in front of four celebrity judges, right? And if you've seen the show, you know what I'm talking about. The contestants, they're on the stage and, and they're, they're belting out this performance of a lifetime for, for an amazing opportunity of whatever the future may hold for their lives. Even if they don't win the, the competition, the whole thing, their lives are going to be dramatically changed if a judge chooses them. But all four judges are turned away, so they're not looking at their appearance. They're not looking at their makeup or their clothes or the way they look, if they have hair or don't have hair or, or if it, whatever. They're, it's a blind audition. And they give their performance. They sing their guts out. And if the judges think they did good enough, if they met that expectation, if they said, wow, this person has really got it, they nailed it, they have a big red button, they hit that button and their chair will spin around and they'll see three big words, I want you. Wow. I did it. I performed it just right so that the judges are pleased. Yes. But what about the ones where the judges don't turn around? 
right? They gave, they gave everything they had. They performed their heart out. They followed their passion. They followed their dream. They sang their guts out. They hit every run and note that they thought they could hit. They did their best, but yet it wasn't enough. And on those ones, you know, after they finished the song, the judges all turn their chairs around and they typically say one, one thing. They all say the same thing. You know, I just needed a little bit more. You know, if you, if, you would have, if you would have only hit this note or if you would have just given it a little bit more if, or, or I needed just, just a little bit more of. And how often are we playing that game, trying to please our judge and thinking, man, if I would have only, if I would have only controlled this addiction just a little bit better if I would have only kept my temper, if I would have only said the right things, if I wouldn't have lashed out at my my spouse or my boyfriend or my girlfriend, if I would have just kept my tongue while I was in that meeting at work, if I would have just handled my money a little bit better, then God would be pleased. And all we want to see is that big sign that says, I want you. So what do we do? What do we do when we feel the need to perform for God or that we have failed him yet again? And if you're anything like me, I I, I grew up in the church. I've been around for a long time. I know. I've, I've, I've read so much of God's word. I know without a shadow of a doubt that God loves me despite all my faults and failures. And there are plenty of them. He loves me. And I, and I know that. And maybe you do too. But yet we still put on the show, don't we? We still try to perform to earn that little bit of love from God. And if, and if we fail to perform, if we feel like we've messed up, if we didn't, didn't hit the note, if we didn't hit that mark, then we somehow feel that God is ah, disappointed in us. I didn't do it good enough. I need to do better. That expectation just hangs over our head that nagging voice whispering in our ear. We need to remember who we are. I want to jump back to that passage that we read, that Paul wrote. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Why? So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God loves to take the things that we would consider not of value and say, yeah, but watch what I can do with it. And do things that we could never even begin to imagine. Do you know how I know this? Because he picked David. David is a mess. David loves God. He's got this passion, this fire for God. He loves him, but he screws his life up a lot. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to dive in and really learn what that means. But you're talking about a man who committed adultery and then had the, the, the person that he slept with, her husband, murdered. That's the burden that he's walking around with. That's the guilt and shame that he's dealing with. You ever think David thought he wasn't good enough? Yeah, absolutely. If you spend any time reading through the Psalms, these poems that David has written, you can hear the anguish and the brokenness in his heart of the screw up that he is. But David knows something because almost at the end of every single one of his Psalms, he says, yet I will choose to trust in you, God. But I I will still continue to follow you. I will let you lead my life. I will let you guide me. Yeah, I'm a piping hot mess and I got it wrong. But God, I know you can take my weak things and make them strong. This passage goes on to say, and because of him, God, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us, for us, wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So if you have accepted and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, in you has become his wisdom, his righteousness, his sanctification, his redemption. 
And when God looks down at you, he doesn't see the muck and the junk and the brokenness. He sees Jesus and his perfection. Whew, that feels good. Imagine watching The Voice, right? The show. And if you've seen it, you know, the, before it starts, the contestant walks out on the stage, the lights are all dark, it's kind of like blue and dark and dimly lit. The judges are all turning around, kind of waiting in anticipation for what's going to happen, what's going to come out of this contestant's mouth. Imagine watching it, though. Before the music begins, before the singing begins, all four judges hit that button and their chairs spin around. And the big signs on all four chairs say, I want you. Imagine the confusion on the contestants' part, right? Wait, I, I, didn't, even, I didn't even sing yet. I, I haven't even performed. I haven't done anything. Right. Still want you. Yeah, but you don't even know if I'm good or not. Still want you. So that's it? Yeah. It doesn't make sense, Right? But that is what is clearly happening right here. We have this God who is looking at us, jumping up and down, flailing his arms, holding a giant side, screaming emphatically, I want you. Before the performance even begins, I want you. And yet we allow that voice to creep in, right? I just need to do a little bit more. He says, you don't have to do anything. I want you. I, 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 I want you. You don't have to prove anything. What can we prove to God? There is nothing we can do to earn more of God's love. So instead, we can boast. Well, what, what do we boast? We boast about our weaknesses because he's clearly told us that because of what Jesus has done and what is inside of us, his redemption, his righteousness, his sanctification, we can boast about the weak things that we have because we know he's going to take them and make them something that we could never even begin to imagine. And maybe it looks something like this. I don't like myself right now. I don't like the things that I'm thinking. I don't like the things that I'm feeling. I don't like the negative voice that keeps running through my head. I don't like myself right now. But his word, his promise says, I am loved. I don't, I don't have a whole lot of confidence in myself. But God says, I am strong and courageous. I don't know how to fix this. I've got this thing I, I've been dealing with. I don't know how to fix my life. It's kind of gone on, uh, off the edge. It's derailed. It's just kind of falling apart. I don't, I don't know what to do, but I am healed and whole according to God. I don't know how to get out of this sin, but I am forgiven and free. So when you boast in the Lord, boast in your weaknesses. Boast in the things that the expectation would say you're not good enough. Boast in those things because we can clearly rely on God's promise that we are loved, strong and courageous, healed and whole, forgiven and free. You don't have to perform for God. And he's standing there with the big sign that says, I want you. And when Jesus came down to this earth, his whole purpose was bringing the kingdom of heaven. The people had gotten it wrong, right? They, they, had, they had made this system of, of performance, this legal system that if you follow every single rule, then God will love you. But if you don't, then you're not good enough. And Jesus came down to set the record straight, to offer grace and forgiveness and say, no, all you have to do is place your faith in me. And 
and the way that he lived, the way that he loved people, he set the example for how our lives are to look. We don't have to be kind and courteous and do great things to try and please God. We get to do those things out of a genuine heart of love. Why? Because we are now free to do that. Because of who we are in Christ, redeemed, sanctified, righteous, we now have the freedom to live and to love the way Christ did. Do you ever think Jesus wondered if he was doing enough for God? You know, if I could just find one more prostitute, then maybe... If I could just heal one more leper or make them clean, then maybe God will approve of me. Absolutely not. Jesus knew exactly who he was, his relationship with God, his Father. Just as you and I can know our relationship with God the Father. We don't have to perform for him. There's a author by the name of Philip Yancey, awesome, incredible author. He wrote a book called The Jesus I Never Knew. And he, and he kind of, in this little quote, paints this snapshot uh, of Jesus. And I, I wanted to share it. He says this. He says he, he kept himself free, free for the other person. He would accept almost anybody's invitation to dinner. And as a result, no public figure had a more diverse list of friends, ranging from rich people, Roman centurions and Pharisees, to tax collectors, prostitutes and leprosy victims. People liked being with Jesus where he was, joy was. Do you think there was a cultural expectation back then? You bet. And the people you hung out with made a big, were a big part of that, just like it is today. And Jesus came down and says, I'm going to defy every single one of these expectations, every single one of these notions of performance, and I'm going to love everyone around us because that is what God has called us to do. That is what God is. He is love. And so Jesus performs this act of love for everyone, not to earn merit or credit with God, but to show the heart of God. So if you're wondering what value your life holds, if you're wondering if you've done enough, if you've performed enough, there is a God who has been holding up a sign that says, I want you from before you even began to perform. So that, that common Christian expectation, right? Perform for God and he will approve of you. Well, Jesus says, you have nothing to prove. You have nothing to prove because you've already been approved. When you place your faith in me, I've, I've already given you my redemption, my righteousness, my wisdom, my sanctification. So, so in, there's nothing to prove because God is already looking down and, and, and you're, you're perfect. And I love you just as you are. God doesn't want your performance. He wants your heart. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. Would you bow your heads with me? What a gift it is, God, to know that you will use even the muck, the dirty, the broken parts of our life you will take those things and do things that we could never begin to imagine. You did it in David's life and you've promised to do it in ours. And so God, as we boast in our weaknesses, we know that you will take them. How amazing that is. You are truly incredible, God. And maybe there are some in this room who have never placed their faith in you. And God, you're just waiting for them to just say yes. So as we say yes to you, God, as we place our faith in you, Jesus, as our Savior, who now fills our heart with righteousness and redemption, 
so that God the Father looks at us, our judge looks at us, and he sees Jesus covering all of the muck. We celebrate. We praise. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for the love that you continue to pour out every single day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple quick things. If you, maybe today was the day you decided to say yes to Jesus. There's a number you can text. And we would just love to get some information into your hands as you kind of begin this personal relationship with Jesus. Feel free to text that number. We'll be in contact with you. One other thing, so last service, we had a young person go public with their faith. We always love watching baptisms, and so check this out. I have my friend, Miss Addison Williams, here with me today, and she told us, I accepted Jesus into my heart because I want to be more like him. So, Miss Addison, I have a question for you. Have you chosen to make Jesus your best friend forever, the leader of your life, and your Lord and Savior? Yes. Based on your profession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amazing. We love watching people go public with their faith. If you've been questioning maybe getting baptized yourself, you can text that number, fill out the connection card. We'll be in contact with you. Thanks for being here. Have a great day. We'll see you next time. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you found this sermon meaningful, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your support helps us reach more people and spread the word. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media, at Washington Heights Church on Facebook and Instagram, and by visiting our website at whc.faith. For more information and additional resources, check out the podcast description below. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.